Hi, and welcome back to this video course on biological psychology. In this video, video 4.4, we're going to take a look at working memory, or sometimes called short-term memory. Now, so what is working memory? In the previous video, we've seen that uh, all, basically all visual stimuli that we see uh, briefly form a sensory memory, right? They sort of briefly reverberate in your visual brain areas. And the same is true for sounds that briefly reverberate in your auditory brain areas, etc. As soon as we perceive something, we have a very brief sensory memory of it. Now, this sensory memory, as we've seen, disappears after about one second. But what you, what you can do is you can pay attention to some of the things that are in your sensory memory. And this paying attention keeps the, the representation of these, uh, these, these items active. And that is working memory. So imagine, for example, you see a display with uh, 12 digits on it. Right? Those 12 digits are too much. You, for, you will forget them. But what you can do is pay attention to only a few of those digits. And then you can rehearse, say, three or four of those digits that you see. Keep those active in your working memory. Right? So what happens then is that you see 12 digits, you have a very brief sensory memory of all 12 digits, and then you form a working memory of only three or four of those digits. That's the idea of working memory. Now, and working memory is roughly equivalent to the term short-term memory. I would say it's mostly a fashion, choice of fashion, whether you want to call it short-term memory, it's a bit old-fashioned maybe, or working memory, which is the term that most researchers use nowadays. Now, working memory has a very limited capacity. Um, and I gave the example with, that you're able to remember only three or four digits. It depends kind of on the sense that you, uh, right? The, the sense that you are using uh, for your working memory. So, and also on how you measure the capacity of your working memory. But roughly speaking, visual working memory, sometimes called the visual spatial sketch pad, has a capacity of about four items. So you can sort of, in your mind's eye, you can sort of memorize three to four items, what they look like visually. Well, your auditory memory, sometimes called the, the, the phonological loop, auditory visual, auditory working memory, has a somewhat higher capacity of about, about seven items, right? So if you hear, for example, a phone number of 10 digits, that's too much. You will not really be able to remember that. But seven digits to a lot of people is barely doable, right? You start to, you, maybe you, you're able to rehearse those seven digits in, uh, effectively in your working memory, auditorily. Right? So for vision, seven items would be too much, but for, for hearing, for audition, it would be okay. Now, this cognitive framework that you have, uh, that you have different forms of working memory, and especially the, the visual form of working memory, which he badly called the visual spatial sketch, visual spatial sketch pad, or the auditory form of working memory, which he called the phonological loop, was developed, as I, as I said, by Alan Baddeley in the 19, uh, 1970s. It's a very influential uh, model of working memory, but I think it's somewhat outdated. It's not really incorrect as such, I would say, but nowadays we have more refined uh, ways to think about working memory than just thinking, it, thinking uh, about it in terms of boxes that have a particular uh, modality attached to them and a particular capacity. Now, in the previous video about sensory memory, we saw this partial report paradigm that uh, 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 Sterling used in the, in the 1960s to test sensory memory. And you can test almost the same paradigm, uh, test working memory with almost the same paradigm. The only thing that you have to change is add some delay between the stimuli and the recall cue, the recall cue. So imagine that, so here, imagine that we're uh, memorize, we ask the participant to memorize these three by four, uh, uh, letters, right, and digits actually, um, then if we show the letters very briefly and then immediately afterwards, within one second, ask the participant, okay, report the top right location, then we're tapping into sensory memory, right, because we're still in the time range of sensory memory, about one second. But if we do the ex exact same experiment, but we wait a little bit, so we present all 12 letters, and then we wait, say, five seconds, then all those letters have faded from sensory memory. And in order to remember any of the letters, you need to actively pay attention to them and rehearse them, right? So you need to use your working memory. And then you will find that performance is much worse because the capacity of working memory is much lower than that of sensory memory, right? And participants will be able to recall maybe three or four letters. Um, Another way to tap into working memory is to mask stimuli. So that would mean that you 
First present these three by four uh, letters and digits, and then immediately afterwards you present 12 uh, hashtags, for example, at the same location. And then what you're essentially doing is overwriting the sensory memory with those hashtags. And then the only thing that is left is your working memory that you actively rehearse. Right? So it's a very simple way to test the capacity of working memory of people using this uh, partial report paradigm. Uh, how exactly neural, neurally uh, working memory works is still quite unclear. Um, but I think there are three main hypotheses. And the traditional hypothesis, which we'll take a look at first, is that the frontal cortex has areas that are dedicated to working memory. Right. So your frontal cortex is the part of the brain that's in front. And that is not really directly involved with one specific modality. Uh, and there would be sort of special brain areas that implement working memory. That's the traditional traditional model. A more modern way to think about working memory is that working memory is essentially a form of perception without actual any sensation coming in, right? So in that case, working memory uh, corresponds to, you could say, sustained activity in sensory brain areas. So to make it a bit more concrete, it would mean, for example, that if you working memory of something visual, a visual stimulus, would basically trigger the same kind of activity in your occipital cortex, in your visual brain areas, that actually seeing that same stimulus also uh, triggers, right? So we're sort of reusing our visual brain areas for visual working memory, and we would be using, reusing our auditory brain areas for auditory working memory, etc. So it's quite an attractive idea. And I would say a state of the art model is kind of a mixture of the two. And to my view, but it, it's a, this, we don't know, it's just my opinion, but to, in my view, this sort of state of the art mixture model probably approximates the truth uh, best. And the idea is that working memory can be either active or passive, so that there are different ways in which you can keep things in working memory. We'll take a look at that later. Um, and that when you keep something actively in working memory, it is indeed represented in your visual brain areas, if it is a visual item or in your auditory brain areas, if it's an auditory item, etc. But if it is not visual, uh, but if it's not active, so if you're keeping uh, multiple items in working memory, most of these items would be passive, represented in a kind of passive way, and that would then maybe indeed be done in your frontal cortex. Right? So the idea being that you have one active item in working memory and multiple sort of passive items in working memory. We'll take a look at some evidence in favor of this idea in a minute. But let's start with the idea uh, that there is a link between working memory and the frontal cortex, which there certainly is. And there are a set of classic experiments, and one very nice one was done by Goldman, Rakic, and uh, colleagues, in which they uh, trained monkeys to uh, make memory-guided saccades. So a memory-guided saccade is simply the monkey looks at a fixation dot, like this, and then uh, you flash, for example, a stimulus here, and then after you ask the monkey to, you train the monkey to remember to, to, to be able to do this task, after say a few seconds, the monkey makes an eye movement to the location that was cued, right? So the monkey makes an eye movement, but not immediately, after a little delay. So there's an element, it's just like very, very simple working memory, right? With a set size of one, just remember the location that you're going to make an eye movement to. So they see a cue, then there's a delay, and then the monkey makes a saccade, an eye movement to the cued location. At the same time, while the monkey is doing this task, the Goldman Rakic and colleagues were measuring uh, activity of neurons, individual brain cells of that monkey in the prefrontal cortex. So they really had, right? So th these are the type of experiments where they really open up the skull of the monkey, insert electrodes into the brain, and measure individual uh, individual neurons, right? That's a very powerful technique, and it has taught us a lot about how the brain works, regardless of how you might feel about that kind of animal treatment uh, from an ethical point of view. Um, and then the following came out. So this looks really complicated, but I'll walk you through it. It's not that difficult. So say that the monkey was preparing an a, a eye movement down. So the monkey was initially fixating here and preparing an eye movement down to this dot here. Then what they found was during the delay period, so while the monkey was knew already that it was going to make a saccade downwards, but did not yet execute that saccade, right? So a saccade is an eye movement. Uh, they saw that some neurons, specific neurons, started to fire, encoding essentially for the downward position. On other trials, where the monkey would make an eye movement to the left, a different set of neurons would start to fire. If they would, a monkey would make an eye movement to the up, a different set would start to fire. Right? So different sets of neurons encoded for different positions, the memories of different positions. So clearly, 
these, these neurons in the frontal cortex had some information about what this monkey was keeping in, 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 in his or her working memory, right? Because uh, you can tell from this pattern of results, right? If you look at these neurons, you can say, okay, this monkey is, 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 has a downward saccade in working memory. So this information, this very simple form of working memory was clearly represented by these neurons in the frontal cortex of the monkey. A very striking, very, very uh, profound finding. Um, so that's where the idea comes from that the frontal cortex is involved in working memory. Now, we also have evidence that sensory brain areas are involved in working memory, right? And that comes from many types of experiments, but for example, the following kind of experiment. Say that you are, now we're not measuring monkeys, but we're measuring human, humans in an fMRI scanner. So we are measuring their brain activity using functional magnetic re resonance imaging. Um, and then we ask a, a participant to keep, for example, a line uh, in working memory. And the line can, for example, be tilted like this or like this. And the participant has to, say, has to remember what, what the orientation of the line is. Now, then with the brain activity that is measured uh, through fMRI and some computational processing, right, in a computer, uh, you can determine what the participant is memorizing, keeps is keeping in working memory. In other words, you can sort of read the, you read the mind of that participant, you sort of, sort of decode the content of the working memory of that participant based on brain activity, and more specifically, based on brain activity in the visual cortex, not in frontal cortex, but in the visual cortex. In other words, the visual cortex in this type of experiment contains some information about what the, the, that person is keeping in working memory. So visual cortex, therefore, encodes working memory, at least in some cases, right? So the, the studies by Goldman, Rakic and colleagues using the monkeys uh, shows that working memory is related to the frontal cortex. And here these studies show that working memory is also related to the sensory cortices, right? And I think they're both quite uh, compelling findings. They both show, tell us something about how working memory works, uh, but they tell us something different. Right, so what is the role of the frontal cortex and what is the role of the sensory cortex? So, uh, well, let's go back to the sensory cortex. This kind of suggests that we reuse brain areas, right? So it, it suggests that if we have a brain area that's involved in vision, so our uh, primary visual cortex here, then we use that same brain area for visual working memory. And if we have an area that's involved in hearing, we use that for auditory working memory, etc. A uh, very elegant idea, I think, very, very parsimonious. Now, one question that you can ask yourself is, if you uh, are remembering multiple things that use essentially the same visual brain areas, how can you do that, right? So for example, how is it possible that we can remember multiple objects that were presented at the same location? So these, would, these, these objects would activate similar activity in your visual brain areas. So it's difficult to see how you can remember all of those different things in the same visual brain areas, right? In a sense, they just don't fit. The, we, our visual brain areas are just not, don't have the representational capacity to represent all the things that we can keep in working memory. Or maybe they do, but that is, one, that is at least one argument that you can raise against this model of working memory. So uh, more recently, people have tried to reconcile this, this idea that you use your frontal cortex and use your visual cortex using a kind of mixture model. And this mixture model suggests that you can generally keep one act item in your working memory really active. That's the item that you're going to use immediately, right? So imagine that you're in a supermarket and you have a lot, lot of things uh, on your in, sort of in your mental shopping list. The, then one of the things that you have on your mental shopping list is the thing that you're looking for right now, right? So, for example, I, I want to I want to get uh, uh, I want to get a beer, I want to get uh, sugar, and I want to get milk. And then, but right now I'm searching for the milk. So the milk would then be active in my working memory, and the sugar and the beer would be still in my working memory, but less active. And the idea is of this, this type of model is that that active, work, active item in your working memory would be represented in your sensory areas. Whereas multiple items that are not active are represented somewhere else, possibly in your frontal cortex. Right? So that there are different ways to represent things that are in your working memory. It kind of goes against the idea that visual working memory or working memory in general is one thing. Right? Because it suggests that there are different forms of working memory. 
which is not really attractive to most scientists. We like to reduce things, make things simpler, right? So to make to basically uh, reduce all fi different forms of memory into one form of memory, um, because it makes life easier. It makes life we if things are simple, that's more elegant as an as a scientific theory. And what this mixture model does is actually make things more difficult because it takes a concept, working memory that we thought of as one concept, and tears it apart into different kinds of things, right? So it makes a messy world even messier. But that does not mean that it's not true, obviously. Um, so in, uh, researchers such as Christian Olivers and Masoud Hussein and others have done quite some work uh, suggesting that this mixture model has some truth to it, I think. Now, um, let's take a look at one specific experiment, which um, I think supports somewhat supports this idea that there is a mixture model. So what in this experiment participant have to do, I'll walk you through it. This is, this is really, if you're not familiar with kind of neuroscience experiments, this may be a bit tricky, but I think it's interesting if you, if you follow me. So what participants have to do here is remember two motions. So first they see a dot, uh, so a cloud of dots here, green, that's moving, for example, a little uh, to, the, to the bottom right. And then there's a cloud of dots that is moving upwards. Um, and then after, so they see them both, first the first and the second, and then they have to reproduce these, uh, the orientations. Um, now, they are presented one after another, and the assumption that they make, which is quite an assumption, but there's something to it, is that the last thing that is presented is active, right? So there you can have things that are active in working memory and less active, and the thing that is presented last, the red, the red dots in this case, would be active according to them. Then what they do, uh, so, uh, at, so at the end of the trial, right, when participants are reporting the, the motions, the first motion, the green one in this case, would be inactive, and the last motion, the red one, would be active. Now, what they then do is apply TMS. Now, what is TMS? TMS is essentially a magnetic pulse that you can apply to the brain of a human, or of anything, but also of a human, because it's kind of harmless and it disrupts uh, our brain activity. So if you apply TMS over your visual cortex, you will start, it will disrupt visual brain activity and you will start seeing all kinds of uh, things that are not there, right? Sort of hallucinations. And what they did is they applied TMS to area M MT+, which is, and that is very crucial, is, is an area that is involved in the perception of visual motion. Why is that important? Well, because the participants here were, were memorizing visual motion, right? So say that both these, these motion, the, 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 this motion and the upward motion here would be represented in area MT plus, then applying TMS to area MT plus should disrupt performance of both, uh, both stimuli, right? Both the green and the red one. But what they found was that the memory was actually impaired only for the last item. So the, the one that was active and improved for the, actually the inactive item. Um, suggesting that this active item was represented in area MT plus, right? So do, do you see the logic? They sort of disrupt activity in your sensory brain areas with, uh, with uh, a TMS. And then they, they look at what that does to your working memory. And in this case, they find that it disrupts the working memory only of the active item, the last presented item, the red one in this case. And hence they conclude that only the active item was represented in your, in your sensory brain areas. That's the logic that they have here. And that kind of suggests indirectly, and I, there's certainly much more to be said here, and much more to be replicated also. This is, I, I think, the kind of finding that you need to replicate. But it kind of suggests that there really is a, a quant qualitative difference between things that are active in your working memory, which are represented in sensory brain areas, and things that are not active in working memory. Right, because only the active item was disrupted by TMS. Okay, now with that fairly technical story, which I hope you enjoyed, uh, let's move on to the next video, video 4.5, in which we're going to take a look at long-term memory.